let us humble ourselves as we seek God in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, mighty King of the universe, Lord of all, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for being present with us for these last three days. Oh, King of glory, we thank you for using Elaine and Willie in a very special way. We commit them one more time into your hands. Touch their brain cells. Let them be your mouthpiece. Speak through them so that the families that are experiencing marital conflicts may find a solution today. Those of us who also know relatives who are undergoing conflicts may also get something to share with them. Please, Lord, come by here this hour as you use your servants mightily for your name's sake. We commit the viewer out there and the listeners here in the congregation. May you transport us closer to you and speak to our innermost being in a way that you have never spoken to us before. So that at the end of this meeting, we may say, surely the Lord was with us. Be with us now and forevermore. It's our humble wish in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Welcome back to our audience here and also to those of you that have been viewing online. And if you're new this evening, we want to give you an extra special welcome. Thank you for joining us. So this evening's presentation is what everyone should know about solving conflicts. I'm almost tempted to ask who has conflict, but I'm not going to ask. Because perhaps everyone would have to raise their hand. Perhaps even us would have to raise our hand. If you're alive, you probably have some type of conflict, whether it is with your husband or wife, your parents or children, whether it is with your neighbors or your coworkers. Conflict is everywhere, and it's a part of human life. And so the challenge is how to solve those conflicts. In fact, someone once said that conflict is, to our relationships, what manure is to a garden. So we actually need conflict if we're, our relationships are going to grow. Now, we are going to share with you what that conflict is. We're not talking about fighting and hurting each other, but we're talking about disagreements. And if you're a human being, as we've been saying all week, then chances are there is conflict in many of your relationships. Tomorrow's topic is what everyone should know about sexuality. And of course, you want to know about that, because there are all kinds of myths about sexuality. Everywhere we go, people think they know about sex, and invariably, they know very little. You know, they are doing things, but they're not sure. And God's word is very clear. And so we're going to be talking to you from the word of God, and we want you to come. We want you to come, and we want you to bring your friends in. We're going to present that topic and talk about this important matter. All right, so as we begin this topic, we want to talk about what is this conflict? What is conflict? Conflict is when we disagree. And we've been speaking all week about disagreements and various tensions that we experience in our relationships. The reason why we say solve your solvable problems is because many times in our relationships, we are trying to solve problems that are not solvable. Now I know some of you good Christians are saying, but Sister Oliver, Sister Elaine, with God, all things are possible. And that is true. But there are some problems that are not 
really problems. And so what we want to focus on is what are our real problems in relationships and how do we solve them? You know, Elaine, before you go into the uh, text of scripture, we're talking about solving conflict. That's a huge, uh, it's a tall order. It's a very difficult issue. I think we better pray as we begin this evening. Absolutely. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us here this evening. Thank you for once again bestowing upon us your blessings, your mercy, your grace, your goodness. And thank you for your promise to be with us. We invite you into this place and into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Because we definitely do need prayer, right? If we're going to solve our solvable problems, if we're going to resolve conflict in our relationship. So it says in Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Live peaceably with all. And so we're talking about taking the responsibility to live at peace with one another. You know, someone once told us a story about a conflict that they had in their relationship. It was a husband and wife. And they had been arguing for many, many, many years about a situation. Here's what the situation was. The husband used to help with the laundry. Now I know some of you are saying, well, that's the first problem. He shouldn't have been helping with the laundry. But this kind husband was helping with the laundry. And the wife was upset because she told him if he were gonna help with the laundry, he needed to put the laundry detergent in the washing machine first but he would put the laundry detergent in last. And she said to him, you've been doing this for the last 10 years. And that just irritates me. And it's a problem. And the text says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So we're gonna share with you how we can determine what is a real problem and what isn't. In this situation, how many of you think there was a real problem? You laugh, right? Because it really wasn't a problem. I say, what difference does it make whether you put the laundry detergent in first or last, as long as the clothes get clean, right? So there really wasn't a conflict, except that the person made it a conflict. So let's deal with, let's share how we can better identify what our real conflicts are and how we can resolve them. Okay. So one of the first things I want to talk to you about is how we negotiate this whole issue. And we call it stimulus and response. What is a stimulus? As a stimulus could be someone speaking, a stimulus could be someone touching you, a stimulus could be someone yelling, a stimulus could be someone doing something. So before we respond, we have to have some kind of stimulus. Isn't that true? Someone has to say something. Uh, for example, if I come out here and you do something for me and I say, erokamano, so you will respond. <laughs> What's your response to? Machekni. There you go. All right, so, erokamano, machekni. That's a stimulus and that's a response, right? I say something, you say something back. And that's how it happens. The problem is that many times we are reactive. We are reactive instead of proactive. Reactive is when we respond to the stimulus in a way that's not constructive. All of us have responded in ways that are not constructive. Now, Elaine and I have been married for 33 years, and in 33 years, there's a lot of stimulus and response. Lots of stimulus and response. And we haven't always responded in a proactive way. Sometimes our response has been reactive. What does that tell you? It tells you that it's much more important not only to know, but to do. That's why the Word of God says, 
blessed are those who hear and keep the word of this prophecy. So as we're talking, it's not only about the problems and, and, and what's happening, but how do we respond in a way that's constructive? Because that's what makes a difference. Uh, and people who go the distance, marriages that go the distance, till death do you part. And it's not because one of you killed the other. It's because somebody <laughs> died of natural causes. The marriage that goes the distance, the relationships that go the distance are relationships that learn how to be proactive. So let's take a look. Reactive. We're talking about reactive. So here's a situation. And what is that situation? A stimulus. And there is a response immediately. Okay? That's reactive. A, a, a situation and a response. Mm. Let me give you a picture. I don't know how you do it here in Kisumu or in Kenya in general. And by the way, we want to welcome those who are watching from home. We don't want to forget you. We know you're there and we're happy you're there. So here we go. What was I saying, sweetheart? Stimulus and response. Stimulus and response. What else was I saying? I don't know if here in Kisumu or in Kenya you have uh, garbage uh, pans in the house. In, in, in the United States, we have, uh, uh, what, what, what do we trash call it? Trash can. We call it a trash can, and sometimes it's under the counter in, in, uh, in the kitchen, and sometimes you have one where you step on it, and it opens, and you put the trash. Okay, so let's, let's, let's give an example. Um, so uh, Brother Tom um, comes home one day after work, and he, he's tired, and his wife, Madeline, she says to him, Tom, um, take out the garbage. And uh, that's not what he had in mind. He's tired. He, um, he wants something to drink. He probably wants to watch the football game. And he's rushing to turn on the TV so he can watch the football game. And Marilyn says, Tom, take out the garbage. And Tom says, take it out yourself. <laughs> Does that ever happen here in, in Kenya? It happens. So you're just like Americans. You know, you just like Asians, you just like Europeans, you just like Latin Americans. Uh, someone says, take out the garbage, and the other one who didn't have that in mind says, take it out yourself. That's reactive. You know what's happening. I'm going to describe what's happening. What's happening is, when you respond that way, you're allowing no space between what is happening to you, what is being said to you, and how you respond. I'm going to confess to you, Every single time I get into trouble with Elaine, every single time we get into trouble with our relationship, and it's not as free-flowing as it needs to be, is when I don't take the space. Okay? You need to take the space. This is an important skill. Okay? An important skill that we teach to industry. And in fact, all over the world, captains of industry are teaching it to their workers. When someone says something to you, before you respond, Take a space. But being reactive is no space. Someone says, Marilyn says, take out the garbage. And Tom says, take it out yourself. Allows no space. Without thinking, you respond. Those of you who've studied biology, you know the whole mm, anatomy of reflex action, right? Uh, someone does something, and without uh, thinking about it, it goes off. Someone once said, I remember when I took uh, high school biology, the whole explanation of reactive or reaction was that it's something that doesn't go through the brain. It goes through the spinal cord. So it doesn't get processed in the brain. It just gets processed through the spinal cord and you react. And if you don't use your brain, you might get into trouble. That's why God gave us a brain. That's why he wants us to keep it healthy. That's why he wants us to rest enough hours, to drink enough water, to not drink alcohol, to not eat certain things so your brain can work. So it's alive, so it's fresh, so it's healthy, so your relationship can be healthy. Lots of people have bad relationships because their brain isn't healthy. So here we go. There's a stimulus, and immediately there's a response. No space. The second thing that happens with being reactive, it does not consider the consequences and the impact on the relationship. I don't know if it's the same here in Kisumu, in Kenya, as it is in the United States. But in the United States, when men come home after work, they have all kinds of plans in their heads. The same here? They have plans in their heads. All right? And many times they have plans to go to bed happy. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't, don't fall asleep. 
I know we're talking a different topic tomorrow, but I may be introducing it now, okay? So they have something in mind. So Marilyn says, Tom, take out the garbage. And Tom says, ha, ah, take it out yourself. Because he wants to get something cool to drink. He wants to watch the football game. And he took no space, and he's not considering the consequences. What consequences? The plans you have. Ah, if you say, take, out, take it out yourself, those plans are shot, my brother. They're gone. <laughs> I mean, I love my, my brothers, you know? I love my brothers in Kenya. I love my brothers all over the world. I want you to be happy. I want you to, your plans to go the way you have planned. But if you are reactive, you may never realize those plans. You may go to bed as a sorrowful man. <laughs> and what I want you to do, because God has a plan, and the plan is for us to have a happy marriage. And those plans are part of that happy marriage, but you just short circuit the plan by being reactive. So Elaine is going to tell us how to be proactive. And after we leave here today, all of you are going to be experts. You're going to be experts. You're going to have the information of what to do and what not to do to have great relationships because instead of getting into conflict, you are going around the conflict. You are managing Managing it in a way that will allow your plans to be worked out and to go to bed a happy man. A happy man. When men are happy in Kisumu, the whole town is happy. When men are happy in Kenya, the whole town is happy. But men are so, so often angry. I don't want you to be angry. I want you to be happy. Listen to what Elaine is going to say. All right. We want men to be happy, but we want women to be happy too. Yes. Amen. And so we all need to learn how to be proactive, which is the opposite of reactive. Being proactive is when there's a stimulus, then there's a response, but before there's a response, we create a space between what we're feeling, what just happened, and our response. So someone says something to us that we don't like. Take out the garbage. Take out the garbage. And we didn't like it. And usually, there really is no conflict, but it becomes a conflict. It became a conflict because someone asked you to do something that was not a part of your plans, right? Mm. So what we're going to do when we're proactive is we're going to take a space. Why do we want to take the space? because we want to consider what our response is going to do to our relationship. Consequences. We want to consider the consequences of our actions. Now remember, a few days ago, maybe even last night, we spoke about the fact that when we walk onto a lift, and it's a crowded lift, and you bump into someone or you step on their toe, and they say, ouch, what do you say? Saudi. Sorry, 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 right? Very quickly. It's so easy. It's an e that's a good reactive response. So what that tells us, though, is that we trained our brains to have that healthy response. We've also trained our, our brains to not be proactive with our loved ones because too often we take our loved ones for granted. They say, ouch, and we say, what's wrong with you? What do you mean, ouch? They, they say, ouch, it's like, oh, well, you're what? too sensitive. Why, why, what do you mean, ouch? What do you mean, ouch? But, I mean, it was nothing. What do you mean, ouch? Yeah. So we know, and I'm saying this in advance, because I've heard people say to us, that's not really practical. That's not realistic, you can't do it, but you do it every single day. You go to work and your boss tells you something that you don't like, do you say, well, I don't like what you said? You wouldn't say that? Somebody here must say that. No, why wouldn't you say that? You like to eat. <laughs> That's the day that you are figuring you don't wanna work anymore, right? You don't like that job, I don't like that job, this job, so I'm just gonna tell my, Boss, I don't like what you said. I'm out of here, right? So I know 
that we have the capacity to do it because we do it every day. So we need to create a space between what is happening to us and to our response. And we need to consider the consequences. What are the consequences? Yes, you may go to bed unhappy men, but the consequences are so much greater as well. Because what it does when we are continually reactive, it's a withdrawal. You've made a withdrawal from the emotional bank account. And if we continue to do that, we end up being bankrupt. And so what we want to do instead is to be proactive. Proactive is like making a deposit into the bank account. And you know what else it's doing? It's building trust in the relationship. Because if every time I say ouch, and you say, oh, what do you mean ouch? What difference does it make? What, what is your problem? Then I don't trust you anymore with my real feelings, with my innermost thoughts. And then the relationship no longer has intimacy. And the same is true for our relationships with our children. So sometimes we hear parents say, well, my kids don't tell me anything. Well, they probably are not gonna tell you because maybe the first time they brought home a poor grade, you said, why did you get that grade? You're stupid, you're dumb, you didn't study, you didn't, instead of saying, what happened, sweetheart? Tell me, maybe we could study together. Maybe we need to, maybe you need to study a little more. So they don't trust you, so they don't tell you the truth. That's not to say it always is that way, but that's pretty much how it works. We trust people, we share with people that we trust. So we wanna be proactive because it builds trust in our relationship. Here's what it looks like. First, there's a stimulus. There's a situation, something happened. Someone said something that we didn't like. It didn't feel good, it made us feel real badly. But before we respond, we're gonna put that space, and in that space, we're gonna do three things. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to pause. We're going to pause, and we say during that pause, we're also going to pray. We're gonna pray and we're gonna ask Jesus, we're gonna ask God to help us do what right now, at this moment, we feel is impossible. Patience. Because the feelings are welling up, the anger is welling up, the resentment is welling up, the irritability is welling up. And remember, this is a well-worn path. We've walked the path of irritability for a long time. So our natural, sinful selves wanna go on that path because there's something comforting about that well-worn path. It's a path to destruction, but there's, there's something comforting about it. And so now we have to pause. Would you believe that when you take that pause, you know what it's doing? It's actually sending oxygen to your brain. And by pausing, you're breathing. Everyone, take a breath with me. Inhale. Hold it, now exhale. Do you feel better? I saw this lady, she felt so much better. <laughs> That's what it does. It's a biophysical reaction. Isn't God amazing? God knew what we would need and he made some very simple remedies that we can employ without going to the doctor, without going to the psychologist, now those things are good and you should go if needed, but there's some little remedies that you can take and one of those is taking a breath of fresh air. And it sends oxygen to your brain and when that oxygen goes to your brain, you can think more clearly. So when we pray, now we can hear God saying, love is patient, love is kind, it's not irritable, it's not puffed up, it's not boastful. Now we can hear the voice of God in that short prayer. So pausing is not silent treatment for the next three months. We get, we get letters to our, to our website. We have a, a prayer box on our website or a prayer request. And people will say, you know, we've heard you talk about this pause. How long is this pause? 
a pause is just that. It's a pause. It's not a stop. It's a pause. Enough for you to take a breath, say a quick prayer, hear the voice of God, and move on. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to think. We're going to think about what we should and should not say. Now, we're honest. We tell you. We're, we're, we're not perfect. So if we're in disagreement with each other, if we're in conflict with each other, there are things that we want to say. And they're not from 1 Corinthians 13. I mean, they're not bad, bad things, but they're not. They're irritable things. So we're going to think about it. It comes to your mind. But you've just prayed, and God said, no, that's the old you. I've transformed you. Amen. I've made you into a new you. You're going to walk on a new path. So you're going to think about what you shouldn't say. And what should I say? that would reflect God's character and God's love. Because we say we love God, right? And we're telling our family members, our husband, our children, our, our neighbors even, that we love them. And we heard what love is. So now we're gonna choose true love. So we're gonna pause, we're gonna think, and we're gonna choose. And then we're going to respond. Now somebody here is saying, Oh, my goodness, that takes such a long time. It's just so much easier to say, take it out yourself. You just take out that trash yourself. That just takes too much time. It actually doesn't take a lot of time. And the more we practice it, the better we will become at it. So I hope you're taking notes, because we know that we're sharing a lot of information with you. And some of it is new. Most of it is not. If you've read scripture, you've heard all of this before. I studied psychology. He studied sociology and psychology. And you know what's amazing what we found? Is that pretty much everything that we've learned in these science books are in the word of God. God gave it to us right in his word. We have it and we read it and we recite it. But living it has been a little different. And so what we want from you during this week where we're talking about having healthy relationships, we want to live the word of God. We want to be God's love. So we want to be proactive. You can't be a child of God unless you behave like God. You know, I just, when we were in the back there, uh, some of the young women who were helping us get ready, I, one of them and she's here someplace. Her name is Jessica. And I said, oh, Jessica, we have a daughter who's Jessica, you know? And she, I said, let me show you Jessica's picture. So I showed her a family picture, and she says, ah, she looks just like her mother. I said, well, she looks a little bit like her father too, doesn't she? <laughs> well, as long as she doesn't look like the mailman. No, I'm just... Yeah, this is true. <laughs> anyway, there, here's the point. Now, Jessica looks like her mother, a little bit like me, you know? But she looks like us. She's an Oliver. And you see her and you say, ah, I know who she belongs to. You know, she belongs to these two. Well, that's how it is with God. If you call yourself a Christian, someone needs to identify you that you're behaving like God. If you're not behaving like God, you must not be God's child. Because there are only two powers in the universe, power of God, the power of Satan. And there are only two likenesses. You're either like God or you're like Satan. Are you with me? Those are the only two choices. There's not a third one. So we do this to be like God, to represent God. People think, oh, I'm going to get married. I got eight cows. Let me look for the girl. Oh, maybe 12 cows. Oh, well, it's a lot more than just getting married. It's about giving honor and glory to God. It's about representing God. Because every marriage is to represent God, your father, your father. And in Africa, we're big on ancestry. We're big on who our father is. If you're big on who your father is, you must know spiritually that if God is your father, then you have to behave like him. That's why. Pause. Ah, don't just be reactive. Pause, think, and choose. The whole thing is about choices. And the choices we make every day will determine how our relationships will go. 
the choices we make with our children, the choices we make with our parents, the choices we make with our husband, with our wife, the choices we make with our friends, with the people we talk with. It will say, you belong to God, or we don't know who your father is. So one of the things we want to show you is to solve conflict, we have to think win-win. Win-win. Some people think, oh, but if you win, I lose. See, people think it's a zero-sum game. If somebody is winning, somebody is losing. I don't know if you have this uh, saying here in Kenya, but in South Africa, they have a saying, and someone may see you trying to do something, and they will ask, are you winning? If there are any South Africans on watching, they know what I'm talking about. Are you winning? Well, we think sometimes that if we win, the other person loses. But no, to solve conflict, we need to think win-win. Remember what we said the other day. You need to think about the good of the other person. If you're in a relationship, you can't just think about yourself. That's the other guy. That's not God. That's the other guy. God thinks about us. God is love. To love well, we got to make deposits in the emotional bank account. To do so, we have to think win-win. Here's what it looks like. You need to say to yourself, when you're married, when you have children, when you have parents, when you're in a relationship with anybody, even in the church board, you can think win-win. Sometimes the church board is the most difficult place where there are all kinds of fights that are happening. And these are supposed to be the people of God. Think win-win. If you take this to church board to the next one, you'll have a smooth church board because you understand it's about win-win. We're all on the same team. What does the team want to what? To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to tell people the good news of salvation so that they can accept Christ and live good lives, so that they can live longer and healthier and happier because that's what God is about, happier and healthier. So the first thing you need to say to yourself when you have a conflict is think you and I can work together and don't be afraid to say it out loud you know sweetie you, you just asked me to uh, to take out the garbage and that's not what I want to do but you and I can work together why you and I can work together because you and I are a team do you have sports here in Kisumu do you have a football team does it win does it sometimes right it wins a lot all the time Guess what? How many people are playing? Eleven? Eleven. When I was a little boy, my parents were missionaries in, in Central America and lots of football over there. Eleven people, I remember that from primary school. Eleven. I used to be the goalie. I was pretty good, if I may say so myself, you know, but as you get older, you don't remember. <laughs> the team, the eleven guys, they're working together. They, are, they have a goal in mind. What's the goal? To shoot a goal in the opposite team's goal. You don't turn around and shoot a goal on your own goal. That's someone who's crazy. You cut them from the team. Ah, you're not belonging to this team. You don't know what it means to be a team. If you're married, if you're in a family, you're on the same team. You need to rehearse that. You're on the same team. And if you're on the same team, you want to win together. For that, you have to think win-win. Let me show you. Most times, when we have conflict, in marriage or with our children or with anyone the conflict is right here and it's right between us it's like a basketball no no push there you go you see the basketball you see it you see it in the middle yeah okay so there it is and that's our problem and our problem is right there she says take out the garbage and I say ah take it out yourself that's a problem and it's right between us and the problem can't be between us. As long as the problem is between us, we're not on the same team. The problem becomes an obstacle to our relationship. So here's what we need to do. Grab the problem and put it out here. Don't have it between you. Have it here. And watch it as if you're watching a television. The problem is here. You're not the problem. I'm not the problem. The problem is Satan. And Satan will bring conflict between you all the time. That's what he does. That's what he's about, conflict. So bring it out here and look at it objectively and say, ah, we're on the same team. Ah, you and I can work together. And then there's a third part to that, and that is, what would a win look like for you? And ask the question, 
What would a win look like for you? Because we all have different ideas of what a win looks like. Okay, so instead of saying Tom and Marilyn, let's say Willie and Elaine. Okay, so I come home, and, I, and Elaine says to me, Willie, take out the garbage. For those of you who are wondering, where are you taking it out to? In the United States, we have a small trash can in the house, and then we have a big one outside the house. If you have a garage, it's usually in your garage, and then the little trash gets emptied into the big trash, and then on trash day, you take it out to the curb in front of the house, and the garbage truck comes and picks up the big garbage. You see the, the imagery now? Okay, so I come home, and I'm, I'm tired, and I'm probably not trying to watch football, but I'm trying to watch basketball, and we're right now in the United States in the middle of the playoffs. Oh, you should have seen, what's his name? LeBron, LeBron James. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Could that man play? And you know he was on the team because he was helping his teammates. And to help your teammates don't mean that you throw the ball to the basket all the time. You're passing the ball. You're playing together because the more you play together, the more you win. So she says, take out the garbage. And I want to say, I'm thinking in my head, ah, take it out yourself, but I'm not going to say it. Are, are you understanding me? Follow me closely, people of God. You think it, but you don't say it. Why? Because you are a rational being. Because God has given you the power of choice. Because God has given you the ability to process information. You know if you say to your wife, take it out yourself, it's not going to be a good evening. And your marriage is going to go down the tubes. And that's not what you want. Because you want to give honor and glory to God. So she says, take out the garbage. And I'm thinking, take it out yourself. But I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it. Why? Because I know the consequences. I'm going to take a space. I'm going to take a space, and in that space, I'm going to pause. I'm going to pray, God, help me to deal with this woman who always asks me to do crazy things when I come home. <laughs> That's a silent prayer. Are you with me? It's a silent prayer. You can think it, my brothers, but don't say it. It's okay to think it. So you think it. Ah, help me to put up with this crazy woman. Afterwards, your prayer gets changed as your heart gets changed. You pray nicer prayers. Are you with me? Okay, but when you're not there yet, you say, ah, help me, help me to, to deal with this. And so I'm going to ask, to, I'm going to say to her something like, ah, you'd like me to take out the garbage. And you're going to say? Yes, sweetheart, I would like for you to take out the garbage. I'm going to say, ah, I want to take out the garbage too, but can I take it out later after I get something to drink, after I relax a little bit? Is it okay to take it out later? No, but I want it to be taken out now. <laughs> And, and you're still praying. And the prayer is... I'm just trying to keep it real. And you're, you're, you're praying. I'm not converted yet. Yes, and you're praying. What's your prayer? Ah, oh, God, I forgot. I should have looked at her mother. That's how she behaves as well. See, that's why she's behaving that way. And I didn't pay attention. But, oh, Lord, help me. Help me to make lemonade out of this lime. Are you with me? Because that's the truth. Sometimes we marry a lime. And instead of just making up our face and say, ah, she's beta. You put a little sugar, and you put a little water, and you have lemonade. What is that? You and I can work together. You and I are on the same team. What does a win look like for you? Okay, once you know that you want a win-win, I can ask, what does a win look like for you, darling? Once I use that language, and you've been here together, you know what you're trying to go for, a win-win. So I would ask her like, something like, what does a win look like for you? So you know, I was frying some fish for you, Fish, I don't eat fish. To go with your ugali. Oh, okay. And you do today. Oh, I, I eat fish um, today. You okay. eat fish today. I eat fish because today. Because we're in Kasumu and we're close to the lake. Okay. Yeah. So the, lake the, fish. Lake fish. Lake fish. The, the, the walking vegetables. The yeah. swimming. The swimming vegetables. vegetables. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So I was frying the fish. Yes. And the, the, the trash smells. Ah. Okay. So I really would like it if you could take it out. So a win for you would be for the trash to be out? Yes. Okay, all right. You know what? I'm a little tired, but we're on the same team. So if taking out the trash now will make you happy, and then it's going to make me happy later. <laughs> okay, all right. Should I interject here that you should just do nice things because you want to do nice things? Okay, yeah, all right. That was just a commercial interruption. And my message but. is, my message is, do what works for you. If you have that imagery and that works for you, then do that. That's what I'm doing. I'm just being honest. Okay, so a win for her is that the trash goes out now. 
A win for me is not quite that, but we're all on the same team, and the team needs to win. After all, she's cooking frying fish. If she's frying fish, if you like fish, it's going to be good. So we're all going to win, so let's contribute. Instead of always just fighting, you can choose a different response. Yes. So we go for a win-win. I'm going to win because she's frying fish, and she's going to win because she wants the smelly garbage out. So we both win. The problem is we are knuckleheads. We want everything the way we want it. And life doesn't work that way. Then live by yourself. Are you with me? Live by yourself. Don't be married. When you're married, you have to consider the other person. That's what the Bible says. You can't live in a relationship and then just want to do it your way. Oh, I'm the man in this house. Well, be a man all by yourself. <laughs> and a lot of men who take that position are all by themselves because no one is living with them. And what you want to do is live a happy life the way God wants you to live. To do that, go for a win-win. You're on the same team. I married you. Oh, if I had the time, I'd tell you the story about how I married Elaine. But I don't have the time. I'm only going to say this to you. She was in her last year of university. I was a young pastor in New York City. And she was 200 miles away. Man, it was the fastest 200 miles I've ever driven in my life. <laughs> oh, I couldn't wait to see this young woman. Ah, so beautiful. Ah, beautiful voice. Even today, when I hear her speak, oh, my knees tremble. <laughs> that's so sweet. You see? Every that's, day. That's a deposit. <laughs> He's thinking about the positive consequences. <laughs> Every day I wake up, I thank God for my wife. I thank him. Wow. I get to live with this woman, this wonderful, beautiful, wonderful, cheerful woman. All my life, I tell her, I'm going to die before, you know, her people, they live long. Her grandmother, 100 when she died. Her a grandmother's sister, 103. The other one, 106. My people die young, 70. <laughs> so I tell her, you're going to be a widow, you know? And that's fine, because I don't want to live without Elaine. And when I get to heaven, I, I don't want to mess with your theology. I'm going to live with Elaine, but that's a different story. <laughs> come, come ask me about that later on. I'll tell you about it. All right. I, I want to say something about proactive, and it goes back to the original text from Romans, where it said, if it is at all possible with me, live at peace with all people. So being proactive is not about what the other person is doing. That's why I resisted when he said, well, I can't take it out now, and he was very nice. And so people will say, yeah, but then she wasn't nice back. You can't control anybody else. The only person you can control is yourself. So you've decided you, you're going to be proactive, but your spouse, even though she sat next to you or he sat next to you during the meeting, decided not to be proactive. You can still be proactive because being proactive has everything to do with the choices that I make. It's a choice that I make to be proactive. So when we say we're going to pause, think, and choose, it's not for me to say, oh, well, he's not being proactive, so then I don't have to be. I have chosen through God's power to be proactive. So if it is at all possible and it is. with me, mm -hmm. live peaceably with all people, all men, all women, all children, I can choose to live peaceably with people. So tell them a little bit about how we do this. Just, just walk them through it quickly. So what we've shared so far is really uh, some daily strategies, daily skills, daily principles that if you incorporate those into your daily way of living, you could actually reduce the number of conflicts that you have. Because remember we said at the beginning, we wanna solve our solvable problems. And many of us are arguing about things like taking out the trash. That's not a real problem. It's just a conflict of interpretation, of a, a power struggle between who wants it taken out when. That's not really an issue. It's the laundry detergent first or last. And if we learn to incorporate being proactive and thinking win-win, then 70% of our issues 
would not be issues. Now, what we do know is that there are about 30% of those issues that are real conflicts. And we're going to have them. They're inevitable if we are in intimate relationship with people. And in families, we are in intimate relationships. And what we want to, I just want to make this clear because intimacy may mean something different to you. And when we say intimacy, we're all we're talking about is closeness. 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 You're close to someone. You, you have a relationship, your children, your parents, your husband, your wife. Intimacy. Intimacy is not anything else but closeness. That's what we're talking about when we say intimacy. When we talk about the other intimacy, we'll come out and, and say so. But when we're saying intimacy, I want to make sure that we, you know that we, all we're we, talking about is closeness. We will stress that it's physical intimacy, yes. but intimacy has varying levels. And in all family relationships, what we most desire, hence why we got married, to have families is to be intimate with someone else, to be close to have that closeness, to have that bond. I love the fact here that many families have large families. I wanted to have a large family. We don't have any large homes in the United States, so you know, small cars, small I homes. I wanted to have a large family. He wanted a small family. Well, we had to move to the farm. You, you marry a farmer, not a pastor. You know. So we went for a win-win. Yes. And we have two children and a dog. Well, we had a dog. It's not our dog. It's our daughter's now dog. Now our daughter has And she's getting married soon, and the dog will be gone with her. <laughs> Praise God. So, so these next steps that we're going to share, you can write them down or put them in your, your phones. These are, this is for when you have real conflict, things that are big issues that need to be resolved. And there are five steps. First, we're going to start with prayer. We believe that with prayer, all things are possible. Amen. If you stand or kneel before the throne of God in all sincerity, your heart is open to God's leading, you can resolve all your conflicts. Amen. There is no way that you can pray sincerely and not resolve conflict. And so we say the first thing that you do is you pray and you ask God, God, my heart is a little hard right now. I'm a little upset, I'm a little angry. Something bad has happened in our relationship. But through your power, I believe that we can resolve it. Now understand that the deeper the wound, the longer it's going to take for this resolution. This is not step one, two, three, four, five, and it's done. This may be one, two, and then we wait a few days or a few hours, you understand. Number two, problem discussion. Remember we said last night, Listen first, talk second. So the person who's been injured is usually the person that's talking first. I felt hurt when you did X, Y, Z. I felt offended. I felt frustrated, embarrassed. Whatever it is that you're feeling, you begin by speaking that way. The person who has offended needs to listen. Listen with understanding, okay? So problem discussion is number two. Number three is specify the issue. So you've asked your loved one to come together and discuss an issue that you're having a problem with, a conflict. Make it one problem. Yes, women. Um, men are very simple beings. Uh, women are more complicated, more complicated. You know, men, we've got two channels, on and off. So you can't talk to us about everything. So pick one thing. You know, you can't say what well, we're going to eat next week, or, or what the children are doing if they're going to camp, or what's going to happen. No, talk about one thing at a time. Specify the issue. Men, men are very simple. Uh, we we can't handle a whole bunch of things at the same time. And you you frustrate us. We get confused. <laughs> I tell Elaine all the time, which which one is it, baby? Which one? <laughs> yeah, which one? Yeah. So specify the issue. Number four. We want to come to some type of agreement and accommodation. So we're going to talk about how we can resolve this issue. And in many situations, it might require some accommodation, the teamwork. There are some situations where there is no accommodation. It may have been that there was uh, uh, some type of abuse that has taken place in the relationship. And so the person who's been the offender 
is going to really need to make some amends. But in most cases, it is a matter of accommodation. And then last but not least, number five, is be tolerant of each other's faults. Be forgiving, be grace-oriented. Remember, we want to love like God, and God is a gracious God, and he forgives us every day. And he says, and when we stand here praying, forgive your brother, forgive your sister of their debts before you come and ask for forgiveness. So we need to learn to be tolerant of each other's faults so that we can move on with the relationship. So again, we wanna say these steps are for that 30, those 30%, that 30% of problems that are really deep issues. The other problems which are day-to-day -day issues that we're dealing with are day-to-day -day disagreements. If we are proactive, if we think win-win, we can resolve most of those issues. So let's seal it with the scripture, and here's what the Bible says about communicating about conflict. Number one, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, don't keep festering this problem in, and you have this, uh, what do you call it, hun? This rancor, this bile. No, uh, yeah, it's just another word. Um, you know, people who hold on to these grudges. Things. Grudges. See, in your anger, do not sin. Do not allow the sun to go down while you're still angry. It means if you're angry, clear the air. You know, talk about it. Follow the five steps. Pray and and then you know specify the issue, a problem discussion, and agreement and compromise, and then be tolerant of each other's faults. And remember, you're always remembering emotional bank account. I want to make deposits. I want to make deposits in your anger. Do not sin. Why it says in your anger, do not sin? Because we're human. We're going to get angry. Do you get angry? I get angry. Ooh, I get angry. And then I need to talk to God and say, help me, God. Help me, God. Because the things I want to say right now, it's going to destroy my marriage. Yeah. You can have that conversation with God. And, and guess what? He's not angry at you. If you have that conversation with him, he's ready to listen to you and to give you the power to be patient, to be kind. Something else. The next thing, James 1, 19. We love this text. It's a lot of psychology into one Bible text. If we read it, it's all the psychology we need. It says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. What it's saying is listen first, talk second. All these psychological concepts are in the Word of God. Everyone. Someone says, well, here in, in Kenya, in Kisumu, the man is, in, is the boss. But here it says, everyone, quick to listen, including you, boss. Because <laughs> God says that the man is the head of the home, the leader. That's not boss. That's someone who's a part of the whole. If he's the head, he has to be connected to the neck. I think that if the man is the head, and the Bible says so, and I agree, the woman must be the neck. Have you ever seen a head move without the neck? If you have no neck, you cannot move, my brother. <laughs> Remember that. So everyone... Quick to listen, including the men, including the parents to the children. Quick to everyone. It didn't say children should listen. It says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. Communicating about conflicts. Pause, think, choose. Quick to listen. So Elaine is saying, take out the garbage. I don't want to take it out. Quick to listen, slow to speak. I want to say, take it out yourself. Slow to speak. See, slow to speak. Not going to do it. And what? Slow to become angry. We're on the same team. So let's finish this way. Let's finish this way. Because this conflict didn't start with us. This conflict started in heaven when an angel called Lucifer wanted to fight God. He didn't want to be on the same team with God. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 too, but your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So if you're at enmity with God, you have to fix that. That's why we're here. We're talking about relationships with one another. We're talking about relationships with God as well. Also in Romans 5, 8, it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are at enmity with God, but he loves us. He wants to save us. And then in John 14, 3, he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you might be also. This God who we started a conflict with because we do what Satan says, loves us. 
and wants to be at peace with us because he loves us. And God will destroy sin and conflict. We read it last night in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. We're not going to read it all. He says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is he coming back to take us because he loves us and he wants to be at peace with us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Who are them? Those who love God, those who are paying attention to God, those who have a relationship with God, those who obey God. A little bit more, a little bit more, and we're done. Revelation 21, 1, Bible says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth are, have passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Ah, if I had the time, I could tell you all about these prophecies. But basically saying, this world in which we live is going to be destroyed. But if we are on God's team, we're going to be saved. Amen. We're going to be fine. 21.2, Revelation 21.2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. If we are in a relationship with God and we cut this conflict with God, we inherit heaven. Amen. Amen. Do you believe the word of God? Here we are, almost done. My role in solving conflict with God. What is that? Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It says, if we want to be in a love relationship with God, if we want to be in a place where we're not in conflict with our spouse, we need God in our lives. We can't do that without God. What comes naturally as a human being is to be in conflict, is to fight, is to have words with my wife, but to live a peaceful life. I need God in my life. Gentlemen, lady, watching from home, you need God in your life. You want to have good marriage? You want to have a good relationship with your children? You need God. In your life the Bible says ah first John 1 9 you know it well if we confess our sins he God is faithful and just and he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness right now I ask the question who believes the Word of God who believes you believe do you believe the Word of God if you believe the Word of God come to him come to him accept him not accepting God means accepting Satan, and there are only two powers. And God is more powerful. Amen? Amen. And he has already won. And if you want to win, remember, win-win, we've got to be on the side of God. If your marriage is going to win, you have to be on the side of God. If your family is going to win, you have to be on the side of God. That's why family relationships go hand in hand with accepting Christ into our lives. Someone today wants to say yes to Jesus. Someone watching on television, you want to say yes to Jesus, just raise your hand right where you are, and we'll pray for you. Someone here, just yes to Jesus. Some of you, baptize, but that's not what I'm asking. Because sometimes we're baptized, but we don't have Jesus. And tonight you're saying, Willie Oliver, pray for me. I want Jesus. I want to go home with him so that when I'm talking to my wife, Jesus is the one who speaks in me. Jesus is the one who gives me patience. Jesus is the one who gives me kindness. Jesus is the one who gives me the kind of family that will bring happiness and joy to my heart and will bless the community, will bless the church, will bless wherever we are because we belong to Jesus. There is no question why we're here. We're here to talk about relationships with one another and with God. Because if we don't have God, we don't have relationships with one another. We can't do it. So even now, one last one. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you know it, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You want a better relationship with your wife? Become new. Be in Christ because the power of Christ will allow you to do what you need to do. The truth is, tell them about what our teaching is today. So we're talking about solving conflict. And so to learn to solve our conflicts and be among the saved, we must choose to be on Jesus' side. I don't know about you, but I want to be on Jesus' side because he's already won the battle. 
And we have nothing to fear. No demons, no ancestors, no other enemies or evil spirits. Because if we're on Jesus' side, we've already won. We're on his team. So if we want to solve our conflict, I want to be on Jesus' side. How about you? Amen. And we know what the promise of success is. We tell you that every night. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today, we pray. We pray for you, for the people who raise their hands, for the people watching by television. Just invite Christ into your life. Invite him into your life because when he's in your life, you've got the power of the Spirit of God. We're praying now. Let's pray, Elaine. Lord, we ask you to come into our hearts right now, each and every one of us, even those of us who have accepted you. We accept you anew tonight in our lives. Lord, we ask that you will transform us into your likeness so that when others see us, especially our spouse, especially our children, our neighbors, our friends, they will no longer see us, but they will see you. Amen. And Lord, I pray in a special way for those who raise their hands, saying yes to Jesus. Those watching by television, yes to Jesus. We're praying for you right now and know that God hears you and knows you and loves you and wants to save you. And even now, as you commit yourself to Christ, as you commit your family to Christ, your marriage to Christ, your relationships to Christ, may you have the power of Christ to solve conflict so you can have a win-win, so that you can be proactive, so that your life will be the joy that comes from Jesus. Thank you there, God, for this privilege, because knowing you is to know life, and knowing you is to know joy, and knowing you is to have salvation. We pray that for everyone in this room and on television. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.